I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's first meeting is Michael Schwimmer, the CEO of Big League Advance and Jambos. Last year, I sat down with Michael and discussed his playing career and the formation of Big League Advance. That conversation, which you can listen to on the feed right after this one, has been the most downloaded episode of Capital Allocators. Our second conversation starts with an update on BLA, the private equity fund that takes stakes in the future earnings of minor league baseball players. We touch on the implementation of the strategy and the development of the BLA sports analytics team since last year. We then discuss other ideas Michael brainstormed with his team to deploy their unparalleled horsepower in sports analytics. That exercise led to the formation of a new sports betting service called Jambos. We walk through the business of predicting the outcome of sporting events, the disruption of tout subscription services for sports betting through transparency and accountability, and the potential impact of predicting game outcomes on the future of sports and sports entertainment. You can find out more about the service at jambospicks.com. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. All opinions expressed by guests on this show are solely their own opinion and do not necessarily reflect those at their firm. Manager's appearance on the show does not constitute an endorsement or investment recommendation by TED or Capital Allocators. Please enjoy my second conversation and first meeting episode with Michael Schwimmer of Big League Advance and Jambos. Oh, great to see you again. Oh, man, it's great to be back. When you were last here, you told the story of BLA, and I thought it would be fun to start with a little bit of an update on the fund and the team and what's happened with that really interesting investment fund. Well, a lot has happened. I got to give you all the credit. You were one of the first people, the OG, to have me on one of these podcasts and doing this stuff. So I really appreciate you doing that last year. Yeah, a lot has changed. So I'm not exactly sure where we were at last year, but right now we've got 180 players signed up to Big League Advance. For those of you who don't know Big League Advance, we are a company that invests in minor league baseball players is we're basically in general a data analytics company that uses our algorithms and models to predict future valuations of players and give them money in exchange for a future share of their earnings. 180 players, how much capital have you put to work in those so 180? So our first fund was a $26 million fund, and we invested that in 77 players. Our next fund was a $130 million fund, and right now we are at roughly, I wouldn't want to say in the $40 million range. We still got a few years to go. We raised $130 million on a five-year plan, I and mean, it looks like it'll be about four to four and a half years it should take. And what have you found as you've sort of effectively doubled the number of players that you've invested with? Any new trends coming out of either finding the right deals or different rejections? No, it's just been getting better and better and better. I mean, it really has. So players, especially on the American player side, what we found is there's a major cultural difference between like Latin American player and American players. And Latin American players in general are a lot more likely to like tell their friends, like, look, this is a deal that exists. This is great. While as American players in general are more likely to keep that to themselves and nobody really knows about it. And so we were able to catch on more like wildfire in the Latin American market. But now since we've been on Sports Illustrated and Athletic, ESPN, all of this stuff, then American players are now being like, oh, okay. And so we're having a lot more success in the American player market. Have you drawn in any more competition? There is... A couple companies in there. There's probably about five right now, believe it or not. And they do really good work for the most part. Really good work. And and I love the competition because it's by players for players. If someone can get a better deal on the same terms, do it. I'm all for that. Unfortunately, there have been some bad actors that enter the space. And that's something that's extremely problematic in our industry. Guys cornering people, hey, sign this contract. The player's lot in the contract's in English. Oh, you can't get a lawyer to review this. This is the money right now. And it's actually a loan 
and it's like a 25% interest rate loan. Oh, we're just like big league advance, they say. And it's BS, it's wrong. But the good news is we've got legislation passed in Delaware. It's on the governor's desk to sign right now. And so once that goes through, that should eliminate those bad actors because it gives the players the rights. The contract must be in your native language. You must have the right to have a lawyer review it. And all the material terms of the contract must be discussed to you in a video or recording before you sign it so you know that you understand this. And we've done that from player number one. And it's important that the industry keeps up with our standards. And then, of course, the most interesting aspect of this is the success of these players. So how is the data tracked both your models and then relative to success rates of all minor league players making it through the pros? It's unbelievable. It's actually better than our back test. And I think a lot of it has to do with luck. We can't really, on players' names, we have to be, you know, they're, they're confidential, but players have, they're confidential because the players want it to be that way, but some players have wanted to speak publicly. We have Fernando Tatis Jr., who is, would have been the rookie of the year if he didn't get hurt, absolute star and even a better person who's come out in support of us and what we're doing. A couple other players have as well, but we've really done done well. Our, our first fund of 77 players, and keep in mind, remember, you have less than a 10% chance to make the major leagues if you're throwing a dart in the minor leagues. And we don't get first round picks. So the players that we go after, these non-top 300 prospects, for the most part, are 2 to 3% chance. And we've had 38 of the 77 in the major leagues. We're expecting over 50 out of the 77 to get to the major. And that's all a tribute to our data analytics and our modeling and be able to figure this stuff out. And so have there been any new fun metrics you've pulled out of the data that you're applying in the minors that someone like kind of thinking about these analytics or watching major league games wouldn't appreciate you have to really really separate the opponent adjustment and more so than we had initially thought so it's not your numbers are your numbers because we rank every single hitter and every single pitcher and really those matchups between a player that we think is a major league pitcher versus a hitter that matchup matters way more than the matchup and we had already discounted that but we didn't do it enough it's really important to get those specific matchups modeled out and what's happened with your team as you raised the second fund I know you've spoken about it publicly. I don't think we talked about what that fee structure ended up being when you had excess demand for the fund, but allowing you to have the resources to kind of build out. Right. Our first fund was a two and 20 and our 26 million, our $130 million fund was a three and 30. And so we had actually it took us five weeks to raise that. We actually raised 182, but I had to return 52 million because there's only so many players. We've just blown up. Our team's now 25 people deep and we've been able to really transform ourselves while staying the same is how I like to call it. We are still a data analytics company, but we now apply our stuff to our new business in all sports, not just baseball. So let's talk about you raise the second fund, you've got a model, you're deploying it in players. There's a lot of effort to that. When we were last talking, you were just bringing in some pretty talented sports data analytics people to the team. What have you done with the models and then thought about pursuing beyond, say, fund three after fund two is done, if that's plausible to keep going with that. Right. That's exactly where we were. We were trying to build this team. Well, we did it with the help of partner Paul D. Podesta and also Sam Hinkey and steering us in a couple names. We were able to really assemble this, what I like to call a dream team of these analysts. And it was funny because they're like, what are we building this team for? I was like, I really don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure, but I know if we get all the right people in the room, we can make something happen. And so we got all the right people in the room and I let it on them. I said, hey guys, we have the best minds around in the sports game. I mean, we got guys from like all sports, like a young guy from the Dodgers, a director of analytics from the Pistons, somebody in the NBA league office, the Charlotte Hornets. I mean, all kinds of people like these stars from these different areas. And I said, bring me ideas that you think we can use our modeling and we can make money. And they said, okay. So they went back to the drawing board. A couple weeks later, they came back about 15 different ideas. All right. And these, some of these ideas were wild, but it was basically like any industry that says, I know this because I see it for myself and you can quantify it. That's what we wanted to get into. So like horses were a great example, buying and selling horses right now, the best people buying, selling horses, they look at the horse, they say that horse looks like he's fast. Well, what if you could model that out? So we start, we, we thought we could possibly do that. We thought about golf as something very similar to baseball because there's, instead of the minor leagues, you're on those mini tours before you get to the PGA tour. Esports is growing. And now there's the data in esports that could be extremely beneficial to maybe owning a team and doing stuff data wise. There's all these different ideas, but ultimately the team broke it down pretty simply. Like, what are we best at? 
right? And what we believe we're best at is be able to predict the outcome of games. And we initially thought that was going to be used by teams, right? So we would go to the New York Knicks, since we're in New York, we'll use them as an example. And we'll say, hey, look, you're playing this team right now, the Houston Rockets. You've got a 33% chance to win. But if you do these 12 things, run these pick and rolls, use these lineups, do this, you actually have a 44% chance to win and basically be a consultant to teams. We quickly found out that teams were not interested in this. They have their own, they're very cheap. Teams are extremely cheap when it comes to this type of stuff. They're not cheap when it comes to paying players, but for outside resources, it's not that great. And to be fair, we don't have a track record of being able to do this. That was really important. So now we thought, well, how do we get a track record of being able to predict the outcomes of games? And that's what got us to sports betting because that's a scorecard. Every day, if there's stock traders out there, you know at the end of the day what your scorecard was. And that's what sports betting is. You're going to predict the outcomes of games when your line is different than what Vegas has. You're finding a market inefficiency. Then that's a game you play and you see how you do. And we did that and got really unbelievable results. I mean, it it was pretty incredible. Let's break it down a little bit. Which sports are you handicapping? So we started off just because the time of the year with college basketball. So that was our first sport we did, again, just because the time of the year. Our model was ready on December the 8th, and we started doing it from then on. Through the college basketball season, we're up about 140 units, and that might sound a little confusing, but basically a winning percentage of almost 59%. Is that flat out or against spreads? It's against the spread. So it's important. Let me just give a quick 30 seconds on this. So what a spread is, is it might say Duke is favored by 11 versus Louisville. And if you want Duke, you have to risk 110 to win 100. If you want Louisville, you have to risk 110 to win 100. Okay, so that's where the casino wants to get equal action on both sides. If they get a million dollars on both sides, it's guaranteed $100,000 profit. It doesn't matter who wins, right? And so... That's what we do. So we do, when I said units, that's how we calculate it. So if we win, we win one unit, 100. If we lose, we lose 1.1 units. So that's why it includes the juice or VIG, if you will, in the units calculation. So it's just a one number that says that. So in order to beat the market on a standard 110 bet, you have to be right 52.38% of the time. It's 11 divided by 12. And so if you pick at that rate, you're going to break even against Vegas. So we're picking at 59%. What have you found in the data that helps you predict the outcome of, in this case, a college basketball game? So it's, it's a combination of two things. It's a combination of data and it's people. You got to have the best data you can get and you got to have the best people to analyze that data. In college basketball, we were able to get data that nobody else really has. So when you're capping a game, you're looking at expected points, not really actual points. So what that means is if somebody throws up a half-court shot that's contested, it goes in, it counts for three points on the scoreboard. We count that as like 0.1. It's very unlikely for that to go in. So we have all the data where other people have, Ted makes a two-point shot, right? Well, is that a dunk that's worth 1.99 points? Or is that a contested 15-footer worth 0.7 points? What we have is Ted makes 15-foot shot contested one feet away by Michael Schwimmer. And so because we have that information, we're able to put together these models to then predict the likelihood of that event occurring more or less often. So it's just about eliminating the noise and really focusing on the signal. And we know if Steph Curry's got a wide open three, he's going to make it 50% of the time. That's worth 1.5 points. I don't care if it goes in or not. It's worth 1.5 points in the long run. And so if you model that out, you can then build these predictive models to predict what's going to happen in a future game. And as you're doing that, I could see how you could take those models and look at a past game and Mm -hmm. say, well, Duke was lucky that they won that game by 12 points because statistically they shouldn't have scored as much as they did. But how do you then know that they'll play the same game, that they'll take shots in the same way going forward. Well, there is a defense, as you say, right? So we model out offensively and defensively and tendencies, and we model out, okay, Steph Curry's going to take 3.8 shots from this distance because this is how the defensive plays over the course of a game. This is what we think is going to happen. Of those 3.8 shots, he's going to make 1.6. Of the 1.6, how many points is that equal to? And that's how you do it. We do that for every player and every game and every sport. And it also is really cool because the content side of it. So I'll give you one more good example. I I think this is our best example. So Duke has a point guard named Trey Jones. Okay, this is last year. He's going against UVA. He's out for the game. Duke fans are beside themselves. This is our third best player. We're losing. I'm looking at the model. It only is worth about 0.2 points. Because of the matchup. Now, if you take him out versus UNC, it's worth more than five points 
because UNC likes to get up and down the court fast. He's a great on-ball defender, and he slows fast-paced teams down. UVA wants to play slow. He's slowing down a team that wants to play, so he's far less effective. And so we're able to figure these things out mathematically, which also helps for content as well, but cool findings that we have. What other sports have you modeled out and been betting on? Major League Baseball and then NFL and college football. So it's really, obviously, we don't have any track record in those sports. This will be our first season for it, but the model back tests at a better rate than our college basketball. So let's dive into those. So Major League Baseball, we know what you're doing with sabermetrics, certainly yeah. minor league level. How is that different from what you might see in a line in Vegas. So it is completely different. The modeling is completely different between figuring out what minor leaguer, how much money he's going to make in his career, then who's going to win this one specific game. It is night and day different. There are no similarities. <laughs> so what's the modeling that you're doing to predict outcomes of baseball games? So we look at each specific matchup. So we take the pitcher versus every single hitter and we do a simulation model. And we know this pitcher throws a fastball with a spin rate of 2364. And we know this hitter has seen those fastballs with that spin rate X amount of times, and we know what he's done against those spin rates. And in curveballs, we model, okay, how many fastballs, curveballs, and changeups he's going to see? How has he done against those pitches in the past? And we go from there. So it's really intense. Now, baseball is interesting. It's not like basketball. Basketball, we have data that nobody else has. Baseball is the only sport that all the data is publicly available. So it's just about how good your team is. That's all it is. It's how good is your team because everyone's working on the same data. In NFL and college football, we have data that nobody else has. And so that's why I think those two sports will have a far better advantage than baseball, even though we've done really well predicting outcomes. Again and how are you able to access that data? So you pay for it. These are millions of dollars. We spend millions of dollars a year in data. And that's why, like, if you're a regular professional better, you're a one-man shop. They're all one-man shops, okay? And these are successful people, but... They're making one to four million dollars a year. It's a darn good living. I mean, I give them all the credit in the world, but they can't afford to spend a million or two million dollars on data plus pay. I mean, we pay our team. We're all in more than five million bucks here, probably on an annual basis. And so if they do that, they can't win money. And so that's why they don't buy or have access to the data. When you started BLA, you have this wonderful story from your experience in the minors and how difficult it was for those players to effectively invest in themselves and then how the majors only support the majors and not the minors. Yes. What was it about sports betting that got you excited to create this model? So we started out doing it and I thought like after I saw these results, I'm like, oh my God let's raise a billion dollar fund. Let's put $10 million a game on this thing. We'll be billionaires in a year. This is great. I got to prove it first. So I went to Las Vegas. 16 days, I was shut out of all the books because I didn't realize it's not a liquid market. The sports betting market is not liquid at all. And so what that means is at the time I was cut down to 300, 500 per bet instead of 10,000 a bet. And I was hot, but th there's no way over sample size they could prove that I was winning better. They err on the side of cutting out people instead of letting somebody slip through the cracks that might not be as sharp. And was that a fluke in the sense if you just went to Vegas for a while and you had a 59% win rate, how would they know to flag you? Exactly. But it's all on the app, so it's all tracked. I mean, they got your player stuff, and they look at closing line value, meaning if you're betting a game at minus three and it ends at minus five, that's good value. They're looking at all these types of stuff. But I agree. I don't think they could have had any kind of sample size. I mean, what I bet? 100, 200 games? More? I mean, something like that? I mean, there's no way they could have had enough sample... Even even if I didn't lose a game, that's lucky still. I mean, at least how I would look at it, but it's not how they look at it. They do not like losing. And so that's why the sports market is inefficient because it's not a fair market. So that's when I had this thought that I can't bet $300,000 on a game, but they can't stop a thousand people from betting 300 on a game because you can't go lower. They always allow you to bet the posted limits. That's part of the law. And so that's when I thought, okay, we'll sell the picks. And now everybody can bet these games. And then that got me into this tout service, subscription service space and researching that. And it is, I mean, you see a lot of industries. I'm not sure there's a more disgusting, awful industry to get into than the tout service and subscription service. How does industry. it work? So here's how it works normally. I'm Johnny Two-Step and I'm, you know, 100 and oh, you know, buy my picks. And you buy the picks, the picks lose. And then he says, oh, sorry, they lost. Keep buying more picks. In my view, it's no different than here's an African prince that wants to give you money, right? The emails. It's fraudulent and they take people's money. They're not transparent. They're not financially accountable. So we just talked about units, right? They might say, buy my picks for a week. They might go four and eight. 
And they said, you know what? This one's worth 10 units. And they went up. We went 14 and eight. It's like, no, you went five and eight. You just arbitrarily said this one's worth 10, right? They lie about their records. All of a sudden they're losing plays, go off the website, mysteriously disappear. They lie about the lines. Okay, yes, I like the Patriots minus three, but the line everywhere is minus seven. So of course you like it with minus three. And the most important thing, they are not financially accountable for their recommendations. If they lose, they say, sorry. I wanted to change all of it. I want to take this dirty industry, I want to turn it on its head, and I want to give it some transparency and financial accountability. And that's the company we created. And the company is called? Jambos. J-A-M-B-O-S. It's an acronym for six of our analysts. I figured they're doing all the work with the modeling. At least I can name the company after them. (laughs) And so let's walk through this. What does transparency mean in this business? Transparency means that our record is transparent. If we lose, we're going to tell you we lose. All our picks are time stamped, okay? And it has the book of where the line came from. So anybody can go in for free to look at our records and say, okay, he took... UNLV over Sacramento State, what was the line? And they can look through the historic records, but yep, that was the line at the time they released the pick. So when we release a pick, an email instantly goes out to our subscribers and it's time stamped with the line that the pick is in. We also now use the market consensus line, which is the average line. So we're not cherry picking the very best line. So we're using the market consensus line, which is defined by this company, Bet Chris and Bookmaker. They like kind of set the worldwide market for this stuff right now. And so we use that line to judge our picks. And that's what transparency means. And we grade our picks as losers, winners. We can't take anything down on the site. The gambling Twitter universe would let you know. (laughs) And how about accountability? Financial accountability. This is what separates us. This is what no other group is doing. We are going to pay you if our picks lose. This has never happened before. And the longer package you sign up for, the bigger the guarantee is. So our 17-week plan that starts for the football season, okay, it costs $3 a pick or less, which is the cheapest of any subscription service there is out there. But there's a thousand picks, which is the most you get of any subscription service. So it costs $3,000. Now keep in mind, if we win a game, we win one unit. If we lose, we lose 1.1. Overall, at the end of 17 weeks, if we're positive, meaning you bet the same amount on every single game and we're positive units, that means you are guaranteed to win money even after paying our fee. If we're negative units, that means if you bet the same amount every game and you lose money, we will give you 10 thousand dollars back ten thousand dollars back no one has ever done this before it sounds crazy it sounds too good to be true but this is us believing in our model it creates a short opportunity there are people in this world like you can't be vegas there's no way you're the number one person that should sign up if you're right you get ten thousand dollars if not you lose three pretty good risk reward it's available for anybody on all sides of the aisle if you think we can do it you're gonna do it play our plays if you don't think we're gonna do it don't play anything and if you're right you get 2.3 to 1 odds So once you had the models built, now you're launching the subscription service live right now. Yes. How long have you gone running kind of out of sample with either your own capital or shadow? Since December the 8th. So all our picks have been available to the public since February the 12th. We had that two-month period where we were testing them, and we hired an independent third party to verify all our results and all that. But then the public started on February 12th. We were free for everybody to see our picks. Cause we got to this point where our system's so good. We don't want people to pay for you. We want people to come in and see it for free. So we've had hundreds of subscribers seeing what we're doing for free, right? And loving it. And now we turn on the switch of the pay with the full financial guarantee on the comeback. We also have a one week package and a four week package. So if $3,000 is too much, it's 250 bucks for a week, but you only get 300 back if we lose. And that includes the fee because there's a lot higher likelihood we lose over 50 picks than a thousand picks. And how many picks in that out of sample since December did you make? 2,768, I believe. And which that was college basketball. And major league baseball. And the success rate of those? It's hard because you can't really do record because if you take a baseball is all about the money line. There's no spread. It's the only sport. So like the Orioles are plus 230 and it wins, you get 2.3 units. And if he loses, you only lose one. So you could have a losing record in baseball and be making a lot of money. But our record is still around 57%. How do you think about the implication of your success on betting lines? So you were going to make a billion dollars in break base. Yeah, we can't make a billion, but maybe we can make a billion for other people. Well, I would think that would move the market. Yes, it definitely should. I hope it does. Now, it takes time for this to happen. So with our people betting, we've been available to the public for six months, and we post how we do against the closing line, meaning after the market's moved, okay? So 
against the closing line, we're still destroying the Vegas. We're still up well over 100 units. Again, at the closing line. But now what if the closing line moves more? Right. How are we going to do? So we're going to continuously track that. And if the closing lines are jumping many, many points to where we're losing, we are going to shut down the subscription service because we can no longer provide positive expected value plays to our subscribers. I don't think this is going to happen for years. That means lines have to jump two to three to four points. And if that happens, think about what that means, Ted. We then become the worldwide leader in moving the market. We are the market. We become the market. And for a company as Jambos, that puts us on a billion dollar plus pedestal. And we could do a lot of different things with that. It certainly wouldn't be the subscription service, but there are a lot of other avenues we could go and we could take. How have you thought about the evolution of this business? Because your BLA funds, effectively private equity funds for minor league baseball players, was an institutional marketplace. And the Jambo service, it sounds like it's far more retail. How do you figure out how to get people's attention onto something that is that different? It's retail that's going to go back to institution because here's what's going to happen. It's going to be one of three things we're going to do, most likely. What about running a sports book? These sports books are run horrifically inefficiently. They try to get equal action on both sides. Maybe they take a position or two every now and again, but they're limiting betters. So that they're limiting the handle that's coming in. There's way more money to the tune of probably close to 10x of money that wants to be bet than is being willing to be taken. Think about that. There's more money that wants to be bet than is willing to be taken because casinos don't want to take winning betters bets. If we ran a casino, we think we're the best. So we would take all that action. But now we need a huge backstop. Here comes institutional money. That's one reason. The second way I see this is content. I see content as a major avenue for us. I think gambling content is huge. And gambling has a really bad connotation. It just does. And we don't look at it that way. We look at it as predicting outcomes of games. Very mathematical, very scientific. And if you can do that, if the bottom line is this. If you can predict the outcome of a game, you know more about what it takes to win that game than anybody else. If you can predict it better than anybody else. That's just a fact. That's just a stone cold fact. And if you know that, you know what it takes to win and you can then explain that to people. Hey, the Trey Jones example, this is what actually matters in this game and why. I think on a content and media space, that would be huge. And then lastly, team ownership. I think team ownership is a is a major, major move here. There's a lot we've been contacted by several team owners in major sports wanting to give us equity in teams at this point which is a huge avenue for us to do and be able to take over some of these teams and data analytic departments and really use it. Now that would not be going with our Jambos. We'd have to make moves there and transition out. But this subscription service, as I said, is just, we're only going to have this advantage for a year or two. I think there's only a very short number of time where subscribers can take advantage of this. Because again, I'm not going to keep going like these bad touts and give people picks that we believe are going to have negative expected value. So as you built these models and you start rolling out Jambos, I'm envisioning all kinds of different interests coming your way. So one could be the casinos themselves. Mm -hmm. So have you had any inquiries from casinos saying, well, why don't you just join us and maybe we can now take in all this volume if we have your model? We have. We most certainly have, but none of the deals are good. (laughs) And the reason is, you know what they cite? You've never done this, so that's why we're doing a subscription service. And now like, oh, okay, this is legit. Now all of a sudden when casinos start to lose money because people are taking the picks against them, because if the subscriber's winning, the casino's losing. We want to stop losing. We need you. We have to put ourselves in a position where the casinos and sports books feel like they need us. And that's, again, a, a reason we're doing a subscription service. And then within the subscription service, have you thought of packaging the bet so someone could just sort of pay you and you can make all the bets for them? That would be great. Unfortunately, highly illegal. Okay. <laughs> and the reason is it's state by state law. Look, we're in the infancy of this law. Supreme Court overturned PASPA and we have that whole situation, but it's a state by state basis. So we do absolutely nothing with bets. Subscribers can take, like I said, buy our package, not take a single bet, bet half of them, do whatever they want. But we can't make bets for them because we don't know what state they live in. And now we're crossing state lines again, highly, highly illegal. Right. Okay. You mentioned team owners. And how have you thought about saying, well, if you believe and your models are right, that you can predict the outcome of games, you know how games should be played better within an existing team. How do you think about, well, why don't we just 
team up with one team as opposed to sort of doing this and trying to figure out how to make it work across the whole league. Well, hopefully when we're sitting here next year, we can talk about the team that we own and what we're doing. I think that's exactly right. It'd have to be one team. I would not want to go to several teams out there just because that would be a huge conflict of interest. I mean, obviously the stuff we have is extremely proprietary and we'd be using that information to win games. We could do that for multiple teams in different sports, but only one team per sport. So what do you think the implications are for the use of these models for the way that these various sports are played as you look out over the next five years? I think it's a gigantic difference we're going to see in the next five years. I mean, right now, people like to think that teams do things using data. They don't. It's a different scale, right? So like obviously baseball and basketball are better than football and European soccer. I mean, football and European soccer, it's embarrassing, the use of data to make decisions. Baseball and basketball, they're getting better, but it's still, you still got that other side creeping in. I mean, there might be two or three teams in total in sports that I would say this team uses data analytics to make decisions. Which are those? The Houston Rockets, most certainly. In baseball, the A's do a good job. The Rays, the Tampa Bay Rays do it just a fantastic. I mean, every trade they make, we're like, yep, that fits our model. Yep. I mean, it's like, <laughs> good trade again. The Yankees do a pretty good job, but it's still, you could tell some of the subjectivity creeps into them. And you could just see again by the transactions and the moves that they make. But again, for the most part, I mean, there's not a single football team that it would tell you makes data analytic decisions. Not a single one that exclusively uses that model and not a single European soccer team. Liverpool won the championship. John Henry, the Red Sox owner, brought in a lot of the analytics there. They still, and they do a good job of using it. They're just better than everybody else. See, that's the thing in football. The teams that have the biggest mathematical advantages, the Eagles, the Patriots, the Browns, they're now the three of the top five teams in the league, but they're not even that great. They're just so much better than everybody else in the league. And what do you think it takes to get either an owner or a franchise to shift more and more towards data analytics? It takes one guy. It takes whoever the owner is to believe, you know, these owners, a lot of them come from finance or real estate, and they use data to make their decisions to make money. Then they own a sports team and they say, oh, we're, we're, we're going to go with how people say in their eye test. I mean, it's amazing to me how this happens, but I do believe there will be an owner. And again, we've talked to two now that have inquired which about sports this. sports are those in? Not in baseball. I can say that. We're really close to a European soccer team right now. And then there's been faint interest from a football. We're not far down the line there yet, but it's possible we could announce something here in four to six months in terms of ownership of a team. But again, it would not be in the U.S. for that sport. But you got to think one of these owners is going to see the light and do this. Just look at the teams that have success. Look at them. In basketball, it's the Celtics. It's the Warriors. It's the Spurs. It's the Rockets. Look at teams that don't use it. The Knicks, the Bulls. Look where these teams are in the standings. In baseball, look at the teams that use it and the teams that don't. The proof is right there in front of you. It's been there for years. I mean, sooner or later, these guys are smart. They have to figure it out. At least I would think so. <laughs> you talked about gambling as predicting outcomes of games. And then you start thinking about that as just a form of entertainment. So how do you think sports as entertainment for audiences will shift as a result of all this data and the way people are watching these games? You're going to see a major shift, Ted, a major shift. And it's going to be from regular programming. There's going to be a 24-7 gambling news network. Guarantee that within the next two years. Guarantee it. Okay. Now, I don't know who's going to do it, but it's going to be 24-7 because lines move, markets move. There's always something to talk about. There's going to be specific shows. ESPN, I do a show, ESPN, The Daily Wager, that just is an hour long every day from 6 to 7 that all we do is talk about betting, where lines are, where they should be. It's already right there. I also think it's going to, these companies that have TV rights to show these games are going to be able to add a channel. And it's going to be following somebody live bet. I think that's where it's going. I think that's what millennials want. I mean, if you look at what millennials are doing these days, they're watching people play video games. I mean, they're watching people play video games. They're living vicariously through. That never happened with me growing up. I never knew a single person that watched anybody play video games. This is what they're doing. Now imagine watching the Sunday ticket and AT&T and DirecTV has a separate channel that costs money right? That they can sell a subscription package. They're, they're looking at somebody live betting these games. Here's 10,000 here, 1,000 here, 3,000 here based off every single play. You're not watching the person bet. You're watching the screen with the game. And then on the right, you're having like a ticker of where they're betting. I think that would be so much fun to watch. Anybody I know that gambles, this is something they would subscribe and pay for. So I think that's a huge area where it's going. As you've built up your team and developed and continue to develop your models how have you built in processes to take risks, 
make mistakes and move on. Yeah. So there's a lot of that going on with data engineers we have hired, but also a lot of our data scientists using the Kelly criterion is a big thing for like sizing bets. If anyone has, that's the biggest thing that gamblers, sports bettors do wrong is they don't size their bets properly. And please look up Kelly criterion online. You can get a, get an understanding there. People in the quant finance space should understand that or could, but that's the stuff that we're doing. And that's the stuff we're looking at in terms of sizing. Now for our subscription service, we don't use any of it because everything's one unit. So there's no sizing issue. But as we progress and as we move on to sizing these and taking risks on sides, you know, that's the stuff that we're looking at currently. As you sort of set projections for Jambos, Mm -hmm. what are you hoping to accomplish? I'm hoping that the models are as good as their back tests are or better. You know, in NCAA basketball and in MLB, our actual results have outperformed the back test. And I hope that's the same for college football and NFL. And I hope we can make subscribers a lot of money. And that's the goal. And again, if not, we'll put our money where our mouth is. The only company that's willing to do that. And we will pay you if our picks lose. Great. And so how can someone who's interested subscribe? Jambos.com. J-M-B-O-S.com. The front page has like a one minute and 45 second like whiteboard video. It's really cool to watch to give you like an overview of what we do. Then there's a full detailed like seven page PDF answering all the questions. You can register. Everyone should register because it's free. Okay. And it's free. You get to see all our picks after the game ends. What did we have? You could see that. And on Thursdays, free picks for everybody. So at least just register and you don't have to buy a single package. Just see what we do, get comfortable, and then do whatever you want. Great. Well, Michael, thanks for stopping by. It was a lot of fun. I'm excited to see you know, where we sit down in a year from now. And awesome. See what happens. Awesome. I love it. Till next year. All right. Thanks. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you know a manager you'd like to hear on the show, please reach out or ask the manager to reach out to ted at capitalallocators.com. We greatly appreciate your ideas and we'll do our best to help foster transparency and communication across the industry.